to see you all here. Uh, we have a wonderful discussion uh, with the wonderful experts uh, debating the case, a unique case of the neighboring country of Lithuania, Belarus. The discussion is a full digital jacket, civil society fight against the digital regimes, which looked super inspiring in 2020. For me, it's still very inspiring, though the picture perhaps is not that um, um, uh, pleasant as we had uh, a few years ago. At the same time, I know that civil society is working a lot on creating the digital Belarus and the digital future of Belarus. We'll discuss that uh, um, with our experts here, Pavel Lieber, who is an uh, expert on digital matters, uh, uh, IT specialist, uh, I dare say a person who jumped from the private sector into civil society, uh, and uh, another expert, Andrew Sushko, who is a human rights defender, uh, uh, expert on digital rights, and also a representative of civil society, and myself, Vitis Yurkonis, uh, representative of Vilnius University, and Freedom House here in Lithuania. Uh, this discussion is uh, supported by a uh, new democracy fund and uh, organized by it, so we appreciate the organizers very much. So, Belarus uh, and Belarusian regime, it's uh, in a way a uh, fight of the David and Goliath when we see the capacity of the regime, it used to uh, boast a lot that Belarus is a uh, NIT country, though at the same uh, moment now after the protest in 2020, we see dozens if not hundreds of the um, IT companies relocating to the neighboring countries and leaving Belarus. At the same time, uh, IT experts, uh, we know that contributed a lot to the uh, overall mood in 2020, demanding and desiring change in the country. So there are a lot of intersections, uh, and uh, I think uh, we want to have here a discussion rather than presentations of our two experts. So uh, we are looking forward to your comments, discussions, interventions from the audience. But before that, we'll do uh, a few kickoffs uh, from uh, our experts. So, Pavel, let me start with you and uh, your take on um, what used to be before 2020. What do we have today when it comes to the digital Belarus, and what are you projecting in the future when it comes to the new Belarus um, and uh, your plans and the plans of civil society developing that vision? Pavel. Great, thank you. Hey, everyone. So my name is Pavel Riber, and before 2020, I was senior director and head of digital in one of the biggest IT companies in Belarus. Uh, 2020 changed everything in my life, so I attended a product called Galas that proven falsifications during presidential elections in Belarus, and that's how my way to civil projects started. So now I am unemployed, as probably many of you have, who attended all these events since 2020. Uh, but I'm happy actually, because projects we do with the teams right now is amazing projects. So uh, after presidential elections, we start to try create digital products following real people needs. Because after 2020, a lot of people left country. And they left country in different conditions. So someone was swimming over the river to cross the border, someone did it in planned way. Uh, but from different perspectives, since, since 2020, over 500,000 people left. Some, some sources tell about near 1 million people. And that's a huge amount of people, talking about 9 million people Belarus at all. So uh, we started with goals, and then we moved to people need. So we found that during cor coronavirus crisis, uh, crisis uh, we had a lot of doctors who were fired because of their political positions, and we created an IT product called 
OCDOC, it was telemedicine platform to support doctors and they started consult people from Belarus online. Then we found that there were a lot of different foundations supporting people and we decided to help people to better understand who they are and help these foundations donate better. And we created the aggregator called Digital Solidarity, which was a product aggregating different foundations together. Then we created solution for lawyers because there were a lot of lawyers who lost their licenses because they were protecting political prisoners. And they lost sense of their lives. They had to do their jobs and actually the platform was helping them to do the online. And we can consider that as a present because now we have a lot of digital products supporting people inside country and outside the country, no matter where they are located. And talking about nearest future, we try to aggregate the total to digital ecosystem called New Belarus. It's gonna be digital platform for digital nation because our message gonna be Belarus is where people are and not where territory is. Uh, our goal is to create huge global community of people from Belarus, unite them through events, services, helps to each other, businesses, uh, etc., etc., and build some political layer on top of that, simulating real country in digital space. And that's probably going to be our nearest future, and after that we would like to get real digital identity as document for this country, uh, providing people some real benefits, like providing them ability to travel, ability to uh, get support in different countries, etc., etc. So that's our movement, because we personally believe that in next maybe 20, 30, or 50 years, that there are going to be real uh, citizenship by uh, community and not just citizenship by territory. That's what we believe in, and that's what we started to do today. That's probably it from my side. That's about the vision. Uh, I know that uh, Andrew started um, his uh, work on um, human rights, focusing on the digital rights. Uh, I don't know, what was that? Seven, five years ago? And, and it looked like a weird thing in Belarus, in an authoritarian country where sometimes even the regime prefer to talk about digital rights rather than the political rights or the issue of political pris prisoners fetishized in some way because uh, the regime was boasting about the IT booming sector. So, so it looked like a little bit artificial. Um, in a way, I know that even some human rights defenders were accusing you that you are inventing something which almost doesn't exist, though um, it seemed to be right, especially when we talk about the nowadays Belarus, uh, about surveillance by the authoritarian countries, about the role of uh, social networks, for the protests and the many, many, many aspects. So in a way, you were a visionary back then when as a human rights defender who chose the area of digital rights. So according to Freedom House, the digital rights uh, in uh, Belarus are very low, almost uh, non-existent. And um, your take as a civil society activist in terms of where does this digital world lead you? What are the opportunities, limitations, risks? Andrew. Thanks. Uh, yes, I, I'm in this human rights business, so-called business, for more than 15 years. And uh, like seven years ago, I, I, I understood that uh, this is a new trend of uh, digitalizing everything. Yeah, that. Uh, and yes, you, you mentioned that when we started this seven or maybe even eight years ago, we started talking about digital rights, digital rights. Uh, many of our colleagues were like quite skeptical and uh, they, they, they told us, okay, you, you speak all the time about digital rights, so do, do it. And uh, we don't understand what is it. Just do it. And uh, three years ago, three years ago, I I was in the not the same conference, but quite similar place where the stage and microphones. But it was 
uh, the sort of the first internet governance forum in Belarus, in Mariot, built by Qatar investors and Lukashenko, someone. It was a nice, nice place. And uh, we had uh, on the stage uh, civil society, then uh, business, law firms, some uh, providers, hoster by, tut by, tut dot by. And we also had the Ministry of Communication and the uh, Operative and Analytical Center Pre Presidency. It's Operative Analytical Center under the age of the President. It's kind of digital KGB. And we had our logos together. I mean, uh, we, we were trying to, yes, in quite uh, aggressive and authoritarian environment, we were trying to uh, put on, put all the stakeholders together, even, even the state, the repressive state uh, joined us. I mean, uh, we were trying to convince them to bring our expertise and they needed this expertise because they were talking about IT country, IT country, IT country, and they, they needed our expertise on uh, GDPR, on privacy, on access to information issues, and they were quite open to, to communicate and like even three years ago it seemed that the evolution in Belarus and uh, not the dialogue, not the cooperation, but some contacts with some officials uh, are still available. And uh, yes, the, the presidential elections 2020 like changed the game uh, like com com completely. But I, I understand that uh, our, we had this strategy of involving of of all stakeholders, even the state, and uh, yes, we failed. I mean, uh, because of the now we are not communicating. Uh, our organization, Human Constanta, was uh, banned, was closed by the uh, decision of the. Procurate of gen general, general prosecutor, general, gen yes, yeah, general prosecutor's office. Thanks, and um, now we don't have any connections with the, with, with, the, with the government. But even some of our colleagues are still in Belarus. Mm -hmm. they, 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 they prefer to work in, in, in them. And but now I see that this dialogue, this idea of building the country uh, with all the stakeholders, there's, it is still uh, actual, it's still possible. We don't have our, we don't have our, yes, we lost our country, the land, in fact, like, kind of, I cannot go, go, come back. We, we don't have the state as a stakeholder, but we have civil society, uh, quite active civil society. We have IT business, quite uh, smart and uh, motivated. I'd like to have uh, you, Pavel, uh, like on the stage three years ago, but now we met here in, in, in Birstanas. And I think that this idea of, uh, I used to say that I took my Belarus with me, it's me, my ideas, my family, and we keep our Belarus. And uh, if it's possible to build new digital Belarus, just to have the, this Belarus in our dreams and have it uh, in our smartphone to uh, unite all these people, all diasporas around the uh, Europe and the, the globe. It's, I like this idea. I mean, uh, uh, let's dream about it, and uh, I know that you IT guys, you are quite experienced to realize to 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 build it in uh, digital reality. Okay, let me be play some role of a devil's advocate here. So I'd say Belarusians had 
democratic society had won a few battles. Like, uh, first of all, when it comes to the like crushing the state media, the social networks, the alternative media, independent media, bloggers, obviously crush the state media. There is much more trust in them than to the state media. So that was a clear win. I think in 2020, we've seen an, an amazing solidarity where the IT sector, the private sector was crowdfunding to various initiatives were mobilize, helped to mobilize the people. Um, the role of diaspora was huge and amazing. Did more than various international foundations who were promoting democracy in Belarus. Mm, the same thing, uh, I think that the, uh, the way the protests were happening, it felt like it's happening here and now. Like even if you were in Vilnius, it felt like you were participating in that. But Here's the problem. Isn't that that uh, the regime played you? They allowed you to play with all the digital toys, all the digital instruments, and basically pushed you into the virtual parallel reality where you are in your social bubbles, where you are liking each other, where you are in comfort zone, creating your neverlands of democratic Belarus, and that has no effect or very little effect to the real Belarus. May have one note and maybe pass to Pavel. Uh, I don't think they are smart th that, they're, they're that smart. I mean, uh, no, it was not planned, just uh, I remember Lukashenko uh, one, one week after elections having COVID, I seen with trembling hands saying, oh, hello, we're gonna, oh, we won. Uh, I think that was a very important moment when we had the chance to overturn the situation, but some Russians on private jets came and some Russian journalists, I, you maybe mm -hmm. it, some people know, some, I see some Belarusian friends, uh, people who don't know this situation. They, the employees of state Belarusian television, they refused to, to operate, to work. And it was uh, like some uh, news made, by, made on iPhone, if I'm not mistaken, just made on some basic programs. And uh, it was a very thin line, but as I understood, like Russian friends helped Lukashenko and his allies. They supported him. That uh, Patrushev or some I don't don't remember the names of these strange guys from Russia. They were like uh, flying several times a week to Lukashenko, maybe telling him, "Hey, hey, 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 come, come down." But I don't think it is planned. I think this. Uh, uh, it's a normal process, and uh, yes, we are all in our bubbles, but uh, we could spread our influence. Pavel. Yep, you have to ask a great question, because beside the fall, we, should, we all should understand that talking about virtual country is not talking about some fun, right? Because uh, we did a lot of researches last two years inside Belarus and outside Belarus, and if you will look at the biggest people issues, uh, there are not so many democratic values in top five, right? Because inside country, it's high salaries, uh, sorry, high prices, low sal salaries, physical safety, a lot of relatives and friends left the country, etc., etc. Outside of Belarus, it's completely different situations for adaptations, trying to understand where people can stay, how to legalize a new country, etc., etc. So, to start building something, you first should uh, create some hygiene level of how people can feel comfortable and safe because that's some basic level you should achieve. So this, that's what you need to start with. You need to unite people back together around understanding that we're supporting each other, that we are with each other, etc. Then you should build economic layer because for now inside Belarus, Lukashenko controls all economy for sure. And now when war started and sanctions came, then he did even more control on top of that. So you need to remove financial transactions between people outside of, of uh, regime's control. And it's possible to do that now, even today. So we have partners who are ready to help us with that, et cetera, et cetera. 
And then after that, you should provide people a uh, goal why they do that. Because you're absolutely right that a lot of people fall down inside their bu uh, bubbles because they've fallen around some persons, right? I am fan of Latushka, I'm fan of Tikhon, I'm fan of Zenon Pozniak, I don't know, etc., etc., right? But uh, if you're talking about uniting of millions of people, you should unite them back around some simple goal. Because uh, how Gala started, why well, Gala acquired more than one and a half million people, because the goal was simple, right? You, we just would like to check official results, come and send us your polling sheets, right? Nothing about politics at all. Mm -hmm. And if we would like to return back our country through building the digital society and digital country, mm -hmm. like in parallel with real countries, the goals should be easy and understandable, mm -hmm. right? We would like to return back Belarus culture because we see that Belarus culture disappearing inside Belarus. Mm -hmm. We would like to return back our land, and that's our goal how to do that. So, and when we're moving from uh, grouping around people to grouping around goals, that definitely should be main target of digital platform that can survive and mm -hmm. can acquire back a lot of people because ac acquiring around person definitely will not work. Yeah. What was surprising for me, uh, not that surprising, but we, we had this perspective uh, of, um, uh, usually we used to, when we say about civil society, we, we, we mean like usually uh, like NGOs, like Freedom House, uh, Vesna, Human Constant, uh, Belarusian Helsinki Committee, some Belarusian Association of Journalists. But in fact, I think that uh, civil society is more, more about communities, about people, about connections between people. And uh, during the Revolution, yes, I, I used to, yes, du du during our revolution, uh, which still in process, I think, we, we had this uh, feeling of communities which united and uh, responded to the crisis, like, uh, I don't know, lawyers, mm, doctors, medical doctors, and ev everyone. And th I think that this platformization and the idea of not just uniting, not just building Belaruski Dom, Belarusian house in Vilnius, Belarusian house in Warsaw, blah, 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 have some events. We need uh, the instruments and the digital instruments, how to unite this community and how to uh, give them opportunity to to interact with each other and uh, i really i may may i say i, I saw the last version of uh, digital belarus and it's i saw the the one uh, like five months ago and this the the last one and it's really really exciting i mean uh, may i speak about uh, tinder belarusian tinder that you're gonna have belarusian tinder on the platform i mean it's uh, I'm really waiting for the release. Kachof, Kachof, for Tinder, Kachof okay. Kachof woke up on this words. <laughs> <laughs> um, listen, okay, I, we're going to talk about the new Belarus, about digital Belarus, like, uh, just in a bit. But let me, like, uh, pinpoint a few things. As I understand uh, what... Uh, Golas did uh, what the social networks did uh, the entire this uh, year of 2020. Uh, they managed to expose the lies and uh, ill transparency, non transparency of the regime, because as if Lukashenko was always winning, 80, drawing numbers of 80%. So Golas showed. No, actually, this is not true. Uh, and uh, many other initiatives were also pinpointing uh, that uh, mm, the regime was always saying that uh, there is no alternative. And clearly, the IT community, the civil society was saying, and the Golas numbers were showing, actually, this is not true. There is the alternative. And um, so you kind of... Uh, showed that the alternative exists. You brought hope that there is an alternative Belarus. 
At the same time, we now have a very grim reality, basically a terror, a non-stop terror in Belarus. The very same Telegram channels, which used to be kind of a source of uh, inspiration where people were looking for information, where people were looking where to go, what to do, and all of that, they are now uh, disconnecting from Telegram channels because that might mean a criminal persecution. So the regime at least learned how to use some of the instruments you were using to persecute the people. And now then I'm hearing what you are saying, that uh, mm, in 2020 you said, yes, we can. The regime responded, no, you cannot. Now you are saying, we have a dream, which is another alternative Belarus, and we might be dreaming about that, but the reality is grim. So what can you promise to or say to ordinary Belarusian who is, I don't know, in Brest, in Baranovici, have patience, we are working on it, will change that, and I understand you are no politicians and we are not participating in the elections, but at the same time when I hear Pavel saying, well, we need to integrate, we need to adapt, we are preparing the, I don't know, digital passports or whatever, we will get there. It sounds like a program for upcoming decades and people in Belarus live now, you know, today, and they wanna hear something positive. Yep. Uh, 2020, we tried, it didn't happen, right? That doesn't mean we should stop and should never try, because when we're talking about any society growth or any real life or any real product life cycle, it always multiple try. So our goal is not just try, our goal is also adjust our behavior to try next time with better, better chances to succeed. That's what we do right now, right? So. Uh, our goal is to explain people that in 2020 we tried it one way, it didn't work because of one, two, three, right? Now to resolve that one, two, three, we need to reconnect back with, as I, as I told, we need to group around clear goals that should be articulated, that, sh that should have uh, normal support, that should have people who believe us in that, and then we should do next try, and to people in Brest we should explain that, guys, you have choice, we, choice is pretty simple. You can stop trying, and that's your nearest future. We mm -hmm. see what happens with the economy of the country. We understand what will happen with these people in one or two years, maybe three years with mm -hmm. some Russian support, et cetera, right? Yep. Or you should provide some alternative. And alternative is to regroup back for another try, and that's why we're creating digital platforms, because we understand that physical space is totally closed in Belarus. So it's definitely going to be personal choice of every person uh, who like to look at his nearest future and understand if he's gonna to continue trying. Mm. You know there is a there is a rule or a nice things like when you are developing any uh, IT product, it's uh, like privacy by default, by privacy by design that this uh, product should be uh, fully. Mm, uh, fully, that personal data should be fully protected, blah, blah, blah. And I think that I'm techno-optimist, and I think that technologies and development of technologies lead to democracy, to more democratic uh, atmosphere and communication. And uh, what I'm trying to do, what, what's my, uh, people sometimes pain me for it, I'm, I'm uh, human rights expert in technology development. Mm -hmm. And um, I know that uh, why I'm here, why I'm agreed to be on the same stage with you is okay. I mean, with, with, with Pavel, it's a big, big, big honor that I know these people and I know that people who are developing these technologies, they are uh, ethically uh, on the, on the right side on the I mean on the on the not on the dark side and uh, always I'm when I'm d d describing the uh, and telling about human rights and digital rights in fact we don't have any digital rights we have only <laughs> human rights and uh, human rights in the uh, digital age 
But when I'm speaking about development of technologies, I'm always uh, given the example that when you are developing any technology or like application or uh, e-gov system, e-democracy e system for the whole state, you are always between Beijing and Tallinn, between China and Estonia, and it depends uh, if you want to be, if you want to build authoritarian regime, you have to, you are using technologies for surveillance. Mm. And if you want to have more democratic, more transparent regime or state or like imaginary state, you have to uh, put this human rights based approach by design, not just privacy. And I'm some, when I'm speaking, when I'm communicating with this nice team, I, I see that they could, they are closer to, to Tallinn than, than they don't want to build uh, the new, uh, I don't know, ghetto or something. They want to have uh, transparent uh, things, yeah. Since we are here in Lithuania, so I'm going to challenge you on this, and you mentioned Estonia, like I love Estonia, but, uh, and it's all about EEE, -E -E, like, uh, but uh, at the same time, one of the biggest uh, money laundering cases recently in the region happened in Estonia. And technology didn't solve that. And when you say, you know, like, because technology is a tool. And when you say digital democracy, it can be like technology can be used both ways. We know how the electronic voting might be manipulated. So again, we are talking about the tools. We know that civil society is using that. So, so uh, when you are promising that technology would lead that, I am not really sure that it can Sub, uh, like uh, substitute the human or the human behavior, right? Okay, so we are like uh, at the uh, like half of our discussion. I'm opening the floor for the questions. For yeah, go ahead. That's door. Hello, hello, my name is Nika Vygovska and I'm a uh, uh, co-founder of Meta Belarus. We were working, co-working with both these guys uh, on uh, digital tools, digital identity. And uh, I have a question uh, to Andrei Sushko. Uh, because that's kind of continue of our discussion and uh, uh, talking about Estonia, we know the in Tartu University they're developing uh, uh, kind of uh, the strategic uh, uh, strategic map of how nation can survive without land, uh, and uh, because uh, because of climate change, yeah, uh, we have other reasons. Uh, our land is occupied. Our state on the edge of uh, be re being recognized. Uh, terroristic state, uh, so we need to divide uh, people who support uh, truth, democracy, and so on, and the terroristic state, uh, and uh, which laws in uh, Europe, uh, around the world, should be accepted, and how, uh, because so we are meeting the digital age, and uh, so what laws could help us to fasten it? What do you think? I mean, uh, I don't know any country, thank you for, for the question, I don't know any country which uh, would allow us or Pavel or this team of nice people to, to host digital Belarus and told that, that okay, you're going to have uh, uh, your embassies, you're going to be recognized, but, but, it's, but, it, but it's for today. It's... Uh, uh, for that moment, uh, I think that it's a long process, and uh, let's. I don't like this b baby steps because we are we are running. Uh, we we are not making baby steps. We Belarusians uh, did the really great progress from the 2020, uh, but I think that this idea if you are when you sometimes you are dreaming about something then you are uh, making plans 
and then you are starting to to build or to um, make your dream reality and uh, i don't know any i think that uh like today it's really hard to uh build like electronic state like a real state uh, but uh, in fact this is a good idea good idea that in our in, in changing world when the we don't have people don't have uh, we, we do have our citizenships but we also have our electronic identity or so called e citizenship yeah not the, the uh, Estonian example, but uh, uh, electronic citizenship, when we are connected to different platforms, different uh, jurisdictions. And I think that, um, maybe Pavel will, 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 will add, but I think that we are on the right, at, at least we see the right direction. Even we don't have the answer now about the jurisdiction or any applicable laws. There, there are some constructs we, which we could use, but let's see. Andy, sh short question. Do you have the e-residence in Lithuania? Huh? E-residence. Do you have uh, e-residence in Lithuania? I have e-residence in Estonia. See, and lives physically. Yeah, so, so next time you do in Cyprus, and, uh, and then the question, what's the meaning of ter territory uh, as, uh, as such uh, is very interesting. Uh, I'm also lecturing on nationalism and ethnicity. It's, uh, I think it's a fascinating discussion. It could be a fascinating discussion. But at the same time, I wondered, you, you mentioned about the digital Belarus as the prospect, as the future, and I wanted to also mention one thing which is uh, we which we haven't talked about yet, which is the how the digital society in Belarus is fighting back, the cyber partisans, which is like fighting, which is uh, attacking uh, the regime structures, which is leaking some of the documents, and I wonder whether it would be possible giving non-transparency of the Belarusian regime to put the entire map of Belarus with all the real estates, with all the bad guys, with the, you know, there's so much conversation now happening about visa issues, and you know, like, so, so let's develop a map of all the officials, all the judges, all the prosecutors. I understand that as a human rights defender, you might say, what about G GDPR? But if the regime is not uh, like following any rights, do they have a right to actually ask for that right? As it I mean, it's, I don't know anyone from cyber partisans. Please don't ask me about it. That's, uh, uh, I mean, still I believe that there are some, as a human rights defender, still I have some limits. And uh, there is a, I know that there, there are many leakage of personal data of, uh, I don't know, uh, people who are collaborating with the regime, but if there is possibility that there will be one person, one family, or a child will be bullied, uh, bullied, because, mm -hmm. bullied bec because of the connection with two, I don't know, some uh, that he's a, um, yes, yes, a yes. kid of the policeman. Yes, yeah. yes, and I think that we have to. Mm, skip this uh, thing because I mean still if they are breaking rules it doesn't mean that we should break the human rights because if we lose our if if I lose my human rights is my religion is my civic religion and I even I cannot uh, I cannot cross this line okay. I mean Pavel, so, so investigative so journalists, so what? If, if, if you're going to do bad things, ask engineers, we have no <laughs> limits at all. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, but that's one form of the resilience which is happening. And I understand that we would like to discuss only the positive things, positive vibes and all of the, uh, uh, and we could organize a Kumbaya session, but at the sit here, and I see some of the pictures of uh, Belarusians who are like um, traveling in Europe, taking scholarships, for the fellowships, and all of that. At the same time, I feel bad for the Belarusians who are inside. 
because you know who is fighting for them, because while I understand that many of the civil society are exhausted and went through like uh, various troubles, but, but how are we going to change the country without, we, it, is that a mission, is that a goal, or we are simply creating a parallel universe? Uh, just one note. I think that my personal feeling that uh, some people were in prison. They were brave, active, and they, I don't know whether they were ready for tortures, for uh, real, really long terms of imprisonment, but they were brave. And they, uh, they end in, uh, in prisons in Belarus. Some people decided that me, I decided that, that because of my family, I don't want to stay in Belarus and fight till the end. I want to skip this uh, and go outside. But I think that people inside Belarus, Belarusians are partisans. And I have my feeling, my very personal feeling that people are, some of them maybe watching us, some of them following our social networks and, or news, and they wait in, they wait in the the signal, and they are they they uh, have their hope that one day we are we have resources, we have uh, some opportunities to to act, and they one day we will they will join the I don't know rallies, demonstrations, or uh, next Golas uh, things. I don't know. I'm gonna ask you a yes or no question. Like you mentioned political prisoners, uh, and we'll ask uh, Pavel whether it's possible to do or not, because uh, I'm no like digital expert or an IT specialist. So you mentioned political prisoners. Would you agree to create a digital prison uh, for Lukashenko? Digital? Prison. You know, just no jets, no cars, nothing. He would be totally isolated from the technology. You know, like you say, there are thousands of <laughs> the political prisoners in Belarus, uh, like physical prisoners, the uh, prison, and you are a technology geek, uh, digital rights activist, and all of that. Say, I cannot put Lukashenko in jail for all the atrocities that he did, but let's create the digital prison for him. No, 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 I'd, I'd like to have a real prison for him, like, like normal prison uh, with, with all the standards, but uh, it's like lifelong, uh, like 25 years for me, for him is enough, I think. But a uh, trial before that, right? Sh sure. Okay, okay, sure, but no, is that I mean, possible? I mean, I mean, no, yeah, yeah, a, a digital... A digital uh, real trial. Yeah, look, Lukashenko is totally a physical person. I believe mm -hmm. the digital prison you mentioned is place where he is right now. I don't believe he's using actively any serious digital products because he doesn't need them. So there are special people with papers who bring in him information and that's all his digital connections. So that's why I don't... The bunker think guy. Yeah, yeah, I don't think it can be uh, like an issue for him for that. <laughs> yeah, I have. Yep. So the question is, for those who do not understand, uh, didn't understand that, uh, that uh, we talk a lot about Lukashenko as the bad guy, but there are also others who are within the system who were like participating in the human rights abuses. Uh, they are within the system. Their relatives, even themselves, are traveling to the neighboring countries, and uh, like. Uh, should we uh, and benefiting from the like um, the systems that we have created? So shouldn't be they persecuted as well? Shouldn't they be somehow like exposed by the uh, those who are fighting the uh, digital resilience? 
if you're asking me about the relatives, for example, uh, I know some families which uh, were like uh, they they do not speak uh, anymore with their fathers uh, because of their positions. And uh, as a human rights defender, I have one clear answer that they are not responsible for any acts of uh, their fathers or grandfathers. If they travel, they could go and then come back and tell their families that you see that it's a free country, that it's a nice uh, places. People are talking, people are gathering, people are expressing the, the opinions. And I do want here, I do want it in, in, in my country. I mean, maybe I'm uh, naive a little bit. Maybe it's my nature, but I don't think that we have to. Sorry, I don't think that it's it's possible and legally possible to to pr to prosecute relatives. Yes, visa bans for public officials. For I I don't I saw uh, a nice Porsche car uh, near the uh, Astoria in uh, in Vilnius, and it was and her. National Hockey League, and I think there's some nice guy, some nice or not nice guy uh, from 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 Belarus having his holidays in uh, in Vilnius. But I don't know who is he. Maybe he is a uh, he. He was involved in some uh, human rights violation, and maybe not. That's it's it's tough tough question for me as a human rights defender. Maybe it's to cyber partisans or to some activists. Okay, Pavel? Yeah, I think that we shouldn't just judge relationships. I think we should judge position, right? There are so many ways to say in public your position today related to everything, to falsification, to war, etc. So if people spreading out their position in public, then I don't think that their connection to relate, relatives should be taken in consideration. In other case, I think it should. Okay, so there was a spectacular research, I think, by Media Zona, like a group uh, done in uh, late 2020 regarding human rights uh, abuses in Belarus, uh, mapping uh, how many, where, and what. Uh, at the same time, there was this attempt to expose. Uh, policemen, Amon, and all those who participated in the repressions, even if they wear the balaclavas, kind of, to show their faces. So, is that work still going? Are you tracing those, like, uh, naming names, those who directly, I don't care whether they are young or not, and as a human rights defender, you can clearly say that they participated in human rights abuses, so do we have the, I know that there was a black book, uh, but at the same time, we saw that there were tens of thousands of troops who were participating in human rights abuses and the repressions and torture. So do you have that data? I know that there are attempts of the universal jurisdiction processes like that, but it has been two years already. So do we have the results? Exposing those perpetrators. I, I, I can tell, tell from data side perspective, yeah. right? So we have some dedicated organizations like Cyber Partisans and BIPOL who works with this data day to day still, right? Mm -hmm. So their goal is to collect all these cases, to identify these people. So they do, they do real police research because uh, uh, BIPOL one, one time presented like how, how they works, mm -hmm. right? So they investigate in any case how real police should do that inside country, which it definitely doesn't do. So for now they're collecting this data because there is no any clear answer of what with this data like can happen if we are not in the country, if we don't have any cards, et cetera, et cetera. So you can't go with this data to international organizations and tell, okay, so you should punish 10,000 of these people because of our local research, right? Because mm -hmm. that doesn't work in real life, unfortunately. So that's why for now this data is collecting and it's gonna be used when we will be able to return to like lawful country, which, which it doesn't work yep. right now. Yep. 
what we do with this data and uh, our colleagues in the uh, consortium, uh, they, they created a product uh, that used this data to save people's lives uh, and maybe health and freedom uh, because you can upload uh, the just AI recognition of face helps to recognize uh, these uh, potentially dangerous uh, persons in the crowd. So you can take a photo mm -hmm. and upload and to see if there are any KGB workers here around. So that's uh, that's a good case of using this data just to save people's lives. Okay. It's an amazing sample, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe very brief answer about universal jurisdiction as a prosecution. Uh, don't want to blame European Union don't want to uh, say something bad about Lithuania, for example. I really like this country and I really appreciate that I'm, in fact, I'm a refugee, and, but I feel here quite comfortable and it's my home for, 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 for today. But I think that after, after elections 2020, the reaction of Europe was not enough strong but because the, the Ten people died. Then Lukashenko. That's uh, usual stuff. Like done. That's. I think that people in Europe, some politicians, they uh, haven't took it really seriously. And uh, this, you see, when the uh, when Russia started the military operation or the war start, start, started. The international, the international criminal court, and some institutions, they started. Oh, oh, wow! Well, we have to work. Wow, wow! They are killing people. Wow! But in Belarus, in, in in the case of Belarus, it was like, okay, we're gonna create some institutions. We're gonna collect data. We're gonna maybe some. Uh, it's you know, it's also very personal. Some some sometimes it's it depends on the prosecutor, for example, or some. Uh, Policeman in uh, in in, uh, in Germany, whether he will agree to open the case and start to prosecute Lukashenko. But I think that, uh, that if we will have the next example of the of such situation in any country, the the international institutions and uh, these ways of uh, universal jurisdiction should be more active. Okay. May I just come? I, I would disagree here with Andre because I personally believe that uh, Europe didn't react it so strong beca because it shouldn't actually. Because Belarus is self-made country with self-made people, and problem of Lukashenko is problem of people in this country. So Europe shouldn't resolve uh, Lukashenko's issue because it's, it's not the issue, right? So and and goal of any digital platform we try to build should be to unite people inside country and outside country and explain them that it's their problem and only they can resolve their problem. It doesn't make sense to wait for Biden, for international courts, for Europe, for Ukraine, etc., etc. This problem can be resolved only by people from Belarus. And as early as we understand that, as sooner we will start to move the right direction. So before we, uh, I totally agree with that, and before we conclude, because we have only five minutes left, is just uh, let's put our full digital jackets here, like, uh, and uh, tell the audience uh, about that new Belarus, which is in the making. What are you cooking there? What's, uh, what's going to happen? Like, uh, one day, suddenly, we will have new passports. You'll have an uh, alternative health insurance system. What is going to happen if that is possible to disclose? Look, uh, first of all, I would like to start off what not to wait from the start. Because everyone thinks that tomorrow they can get new passport with our Pagonia, like on it, and uh, visa less entrance to all countries in the world. That's not going to happen, right? So Belarus problem is not unique at all, like not not just at all. It's 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 so small. So when we're talking to United Nations, when we're talking about ministries of different countries, <laughs> we hear absolutely pragmatic answers. They tell guys, there are so many refugees in the world. Why you think you're so unique that you should? Can, that you can get your own passport in parallel with real existing country, right? So when we're talking about society, political levels, like digital country, etc., there are some interests appearing, but it's really small. And 
to get any real travel document, you definitely should combine huge amount of people in digital space with working institutes, with clear, responsible uh, people, with uh, political organizations. So it should be real country. We are quite far from that. We're dreaming about that, but we are far, quite far from that. And uh, as I told before, we should start with some hygiene level. So hygiene level is to be united, get understandable targets for near future, get people responsible for these targets, get people support to execute these targets from people perspectives, for, from financial perspectives, from economy perspectives. It's one way. And digital platform is just a tool here, but any technology follows people and people processes. If we don't have people and people processes, then there are no any technology in the world that can help us to build this community and this society. So we're gonna start this first hygiene level, actually pretty close this autumn. There are gonna be a release of product for past uh, internal testings. And, but that's still first step on one way. And it's important to understand that because we are always waiting for miracle and it's better if this miracle can happen without our participation, but in the real world, nothing can happen without our participation. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, I fully agree with Pavel. And uh, just add that uh, I told about the communities, of uh, helping the communities to be connected, helping the people to find each other. Even it's Tinder, even it's Belarusian Tinder. I'm married, but I'm not, not going to use it, but still, it's a good idea. Uh, I think that, that, <laughs> I think that we, we have I, I, this... I, I, see, I see this most attractive part, because you mentioned it already <laughs> no, I, so yes. times across sent multiple and other models. I mean, I, I think I'm, I'm just advertising your, uh, your product, because uh, I know that sex is something that could be the, the driver of, of, of everything, one of the drivers. I think that uh, I don't know uh, the, how the digital Belarus will, would look in one, two, or three years, but I know that it's a good tool to preserve to, to preserve uh, our ties with each other, to preserve our communities, to preserve and to develop our language. It's, it's, it's very important to be connected, to have this virtual uh, ties and have the feeling of uh, being together to keep this uh, atmosphere of solidarity. And uh, let's see, I don't know, I hope we will win. If not, that the next generation will, will win, definitely. We don't have any other yeah, but I, pl I plan to do it during mine. Yeah, uh, listen, so um, to sum up, I think that uh, I like the, word, uh, the words of uh, Pavel when he said that people do matter. Maybe territory doesn't matter that much, but at the same time, we saw hundreds of thousands of people marching in the streets in Belarus. I want to see at least hundreds of thousands of people marching in whichever social network, whichever digital Belarus, to see them there like in some uh, numbers because people in virtual reality, they are, should be still people, human beings. But without that, uh, but I didn't want to end with the punch. I think that uh, we discussed a lot of things in terms how digital, uh, how technology helped to mobilize people. We have seen to make Belarus more transparent, more accountable, still in the process. We have seen an amazing IT engagement uh, and solidarity, providing retraining courses, uh, offering crowdfunding to the civil society. We. Lithuania benefited from the relocations because uh, EPAM, Wargaming, Flow, and others relocated to Lithuania, but there are many others who are um, based elsewhere, and I know that they are working on that future uh, in Belarus. On top of that, we need to mention that there are a bunch of Belarusian companies and uh, people who are trying to help Ukraine 
providing some sort of civic intelligence, if you will. Uh, so, so it's not all that you only care about yourself, but it's also a solidarity issue. So you were an inspiration in 2020. I think that there is some phase of fatigue where you need to recharge your batteries, reboot yourself. So I hope uh, you are not losing your focus. You are not only dreaming about things which are going to happen in the upcoming decades, but you'll think of how to actually help the people who are still on the ground, still in that physical Belarus, to make their life easier. So with this, I want to thank and applaud our panelists, but most of all, all the amazing Belarusian people who are who were an inspiration and who continue to be an inspiration. Thank you very much. Thank you.